Hi everyone and welcome back to my breakout code along where we will be making a breakout game in Godot 4.2. In this video we will be using C Sharp but I also have a GDescript version if you prefer that. You can find a link to it in the description to this video. This video will also assume that you already know how to set up Godot to work with C Sharp and Visual Code or whatever IDE you prefer. If you need help with this, then I also have a video for that. Again, the link is in the description. The first thing we will be adding to the game is the player paddle. And that is what this video is about. And now let's get started. Okay, so the first thing I did was to create a scene for the level. And also one for the paddle. I want our paddle to be a character body 2D node, and it then also needs a sprite and a collision shape. As I mentioned the last time, I will be making a breakout game using some of the free platformer art from Kenny, but you can use whatever you like of course. For now, I have just set the shape of the collision shape to be a rectangle, but we might change this in later episodes. In the last episode, I gave you a lot of questions to think about when we design the paddle for the game. We talked about who the ideal player of the game would be and how the game should be played. For my game, I've chosen that, well, someone like myself is my ideal player. Most of the time, I play games on my laptop while I sit on either a couch or a comfortable chair. And with kids, work, a garden, a house and so on, I mainly just play short sessions. So how does this affect how the game is played? Well, I usually can't really use a mouse when I sit on the couch. And I also think that the trackpad on my laptop is impossible to use for gaming if you have to use it all the time. Like to move the paddle in a breakout game. So input from the mouse is out, but keyboard input is fine. So that is what I'm going for. And I definitely prefer using WASD keys over the arrow keys for something like this. So in the input map settings, I have added the WASD keys to the UI left, right, up and down actions. To move the paddle, I've added a script to the paddle scene's root node. Here, I first add a physics process function. In this function, I then create a new vector for the move direction and set this to zero. And then we either decrease or increase the X part if the UI left or UI right key is pressed. We also want to add speed to the paddle. So I created an exported variable for this just before the physics process function. Making the variable exported like this makes it possible for us to change it from the Godot editor, which is super handy when we test and balance the game later on. Finally, we move the paddle using the move and collide function and the move direction multiplied with the speed and delta. Before we test how this works, I add an instance of the paddle to the level scene and place it correctly. And in the project settings, I have set the size of the viewport to 920 times 1080 and the stretch mode to canvas item and the aspect to keep. So the level will always look the same, even if we resize the window. Now the player can move the paddle using the keyboard. The next thing is to decide how and where the paddle moves. In most breakout games, the paddle movement is bound to the screen 
and has no vertical movement. And this is also what I started out with. You can keep the paddle from moving outside the screen in a number of ways. I prefer to do it using walls. Later on, I can then use these walls if I need to restrict the movement of either the paddle or the ball in other parts of the game. Okay, so for my wall scene, I've chosen that the root node should be a static body 2D. We won't be moving these walls at all once the game is running. And this scene also has a sprite node and a collision shape. The art I've chosen for my walls is actually just a square, but the walls might be all kinds of sizes, and I want to make it really easy for me to change the size of a wall later on. In the level scene, I want to be able to resize the wall, and then have the sprite texture repeat itself automatically. So it should look something like this. This proved to be a bit more complicated than first anticipated, but I found a nice little solution anyways. At first, when I resize the wall, the sprite texture is just stretched. In the wall scene, we can select the sprite and enable texture repeat, and also enable region. Now let's see what happens when we set the width and the height of the region to something larger than what the texture actually is. The box texture I'm using is 70 by 70 pixels. So I just test the texture repeat by setting the width and the height to 140. This will repeat the texture. However, now the collision shape doesn't match up, but that's okay. We will fix this later by scaling the sprite. I created a script for the wall scene, and first I added a ready function, created a variable to store a reference to the wall's sprite, and then set this in the ready function. I want to change how the sprite looks based on how the root node is scaled. The total size of the wall is the size of the sprite multiplied by the wall's scale. So I first store a copy of the sprite's region rectangle in a variable called new region rect. I then set the size to be the size of the wall, and finally I set the size of the sprite's region rect to this. Remember that the sprite wouldn't match with the collision shape if we only changed the region? I will fix this here in the last line, where I divide the sprite's scale with the root node scale. Now, when we scale a wall, the sprite will automatically be updated correctly. We can see this when we run the game. To restrict the paddle movement, I then finally added a wall to the left and to the right of the screen. If you want the paddle to be able to move a bit up and down as well, then you can set the paddle's velocity using the input.getVector function. And then move using move and slide instead of move and collide. If you use the move and slide function to move the paddle, then remember to multiply the velocity with the speed. You don't need the delta value here. We can then use invisible walls to restrict the movement in the up and down direction. It can be a good idea to place this wall on another collision layer, so that the ball doesn't hit them later on. And then of course, we also have to remember to add this new layer to the paddle's collision mask. I won't be adding vertical movement like this to my game, but you can of course. However, I do want the paddle to be able to jump. I'm not sure yet if this should be enabled from the start or by some kind of pickup, but I think it's a fun addition to the paddle movement. To make the paddle jump, I have added a new jump action to the input map and assigned it to the space key. 
In the script, I've added two new exported variables. One for the jump force and one for the gravity. The ready function now has both a few changes and a few new things. First, we multiply the move direction with the speed right after handling input from the input keys. To see if we should jump, we use the isOnFloor function to check if the paddle collided with the floor the last time it was moved using the move and slide function. You can read more about this function in the documentation. I have left a link to where you can find it in the description to this video. If the paddle is on the floor and we've just pressed the jump action, then we subtract the jump force from the vertical part of the move direction. If, however, the paddle isn't on the floor, then we decrease the vertical move direction by the gravity times delta, which is the time passed since the last frame. Finally, we set the velocity to the move direction and move the paddle using the move and slide function. Try to experiment with the jumping if you want to add it to your game. Change the jump force, the speed and the gravity to get a good feeling of how they impact the paddle's movement and what you think is the most fun. The final thing I will add to my paddle movement right now is a bit of friction. When I did this, I also refactored the code into a few functions to make everything easier to maintain. For the friction, I added two new exported variables, friction x and limit x. I also changed the move direction vector to an integer variable where we store the horizontal direction the player wants to move the paddle in. And finally, I added a new current velocity variable to store the paddle's velocity while we work on it. Ok, so first, in the process function, we of course call all the new function I made during the refactor. But we also start by setting the current velocity to the velocity of the paddle, and then just before we move using the move and slide function, we set the velocity to the current velocity. The handle input apply gravity and apply friction functions can then all change the current velocity before the paddle's velocity is updated. Instead of setting the horizontal velocity to zero just before we handle input, we then just set the move direction x to zero and update this variable if a key is pressed. And whenever we changed the move direction vector before, we now just change the current velocity directly, like here when the paddle jumps. In the new apply friction function, I then reduce the horizontal part of the current velocity if no input was given and the paddle is moving. If the player pressed a movement key and the move direction x variable thus isn't zero, I then set the current velocity as before. And finally, if the absolute value of the horizontal velocity is lower than the limit, then I just set the current velocity to zero. And that is basically how I made my pattern move. The next step will be to add a ball to the game. The ball should of course be moving and bouncing off either some walls the border of the screen, or something similar. It's completely up to you. But the most interesting design choice is how the ball will act when it hits the paddle. Will the ball always be perfectly reflected? Or will how the ball bounces depend on where on the paddle it hits? Will it always bounce only in the vertical direction or will it sometimes also bounce back in the horizontal direction? Consider trying out a few things and see how they feel. What seems the most fun? How will the interaction affect the rest of the game? What feels fun? You can add a lot of fun things to your breakout game later on, but 
if you can make the basic movements and interactions fun in themselves, then you have a very good foundation for a fun game. I highly recommend you give it your best shot before looking ahead for my solutions. Also, if you're following this code along, please consider joining the Megatech Discord channel and share your progress. In the next episode, I will be sharing how the ball in my breakout game works and why I chose to make it like that. I might also add a few hints to how it can be done differently. Have fun coding! Bye!